Good evening and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're going to be in chapters 41, 40 and 41 tonight. So let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, again, as always, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of coming together and studying your word, for the freedom to study your word. Thank you for what we learned tonight. Thank you for showing us Joseph, showing us that even though he was away from everywhere that he could have been trained about you, he still followed you, and he still trusted you, and he grew in you. So regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the situations that we find ourselves in, we grow. So help us to learn from him. Help us to learn. There are several lessons to learn from him. So we praise you for that. Forgive us where we fall short and use us for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um... Last week, we finished chapter 39, and we Potiphar had just thrown Joseph in the king's prison, the worst place you could be, because Potiphar's wife had falsely accused Joseph of trying to sexually assault her. So um, that's where we find ourselves tonight. And before long, the warden figures out that Joseph is just this outstanding guy, and he practically has him running the prison. So in chapter 40, we see that some other guys get in trouble. The cupbearer, the main cupbearer, and the main baker for the Pharaoh find themselves uh, in trouble with Pharaoh, and they've been thrown into the king's prison. The warden assigns them to Joseph, and they've been there uh, for quite a while, some time it says, and one night they both have these dreams that kind of trouble them. So the next morning, Joseph is going through, he's making his rounds, he sees them, and they're looking sad, they're looking dejected, and he asks them why. Well, right there <laughs> is the first thing that we can look at and say, why would he even care? He's in a dungeon of a prison, stuck there falsely. He sees this sad look on these guys' face, and he cares enough to even ask them why they're feeling down and why they're looking so dejected. And so they tell him, they tell Joseph that they both had dreams last night and that they don't understand them. They don't know what they mean. And so Joseph says, okay, I'll, the Lord will help us and I'll, I'll see if we can see what your dreams mean. So the cupbearer tells him about his dream. He says, I dreamed that I saw a vine with three branches and those branches bloomed and they grew these really nice grapes. I had the Pharaoh's cup. I squeezed the grapes in his cup and gave him his cup. And Joseph said, okay, the three branches represent three days. In three days, you're going to be restored to your previous position with Pharaoh. And when you are, would you show kindness to me? And would you remember me and, and tell Pharaoh about me being here in prison and that I'm unjustly here? And maybe he'll show kindness to me. So then the baker sees, wow, he got a really good interpretation for his dream. I'll tell him my dream too. So the baker tells Joseph, I had three baskets of bread on my head. And the top one had just these really the finest baked goods going to the Pharaoh. But the birds kept eating out of that basket. And so Joseph says, well, in three days, Pharaoh will have your head cut off and your body will imp be impaled on a pole and the birds will eat your flesh. So the third day rolls around, and uh, it's Pharaoh's birthday. And so Pharaoh throws a feast for his officials, and he does restore the cupbearer to his previous position, and he has the baker killed and his body impaled. So that was uh, pretty much chapter 40. Chapter 41, oh, and the cupbearer did not remember to tell Pharaoh about Joseph. So chapter 41, two full years, it says, have passed. And Pharaoh has two dreams. And so he was troubled by his dreams. He sent for his magicians and his wise men from all over Egypt. And he, he tells them the dreams and, and they can't interpret his dreams. They, they don't have a clue. They have nothing. And so finally the cupbearer goes, oh yeah. He says, and he tells Pharaoh, he says, when I was in prison, the the baker, remember your old baker? <laughs> and I both had these dreams. And this Joseph that was in the prison, he interpreted those dreams and they came true just the way 
that he said they would. I was restored and you had the baker killed and impaled. And that is, and so they, it, the dreams turned out exactly the way Joseph, this man in prison, uh, told us that they would. So that is where our lesson actually begins tonight. And so we start in um, chapter 41, verses 14 through 16. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought the, from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said that you, I have heard it said <clears throat> of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer that he desires. So he sends for Joseph and Joseph has to clean up. I mean, Joseph, it's been two years since the cupbearer and the baker have been there. And he's in this dungeon of a prison. Remember that word dungeon is the same word that was used for cistern, like that hole in the ground that his brothers put him in. There are no baths. There are no changes of clothes. There are no, there is no shaving. There's no nothing when you're in that kind of prison. And so he had to shave. Hebrew men didn't normally shave their beard. As a matter of fact, in I guess Leviticus or wherever it talks about all that, their beards, they did not shave. They grew their beards. But that would have been an offense to Pharaoh. In Egypt, beards were associated with their Egyptian gods. And of course, Pharaoh was kind of considered a god. So Pharaoh could wear a beard, but the Egyptian men didn't wear beards. And so, as a matter of fact, most of them even shave their heads. And so, it says that he was quickly brought. Pharaoh was the absolute authority in Egypt. No one could question his authority. Anything he said was just absolute law and carried out. And so, quickly, Joseph was cleaned up and he was brought before Pharaoh. And not only was Pharaoh power very powerful in Egypt, <clears throat> but Egypt was the powerhouse. It was the most powerful na nation in its time. So they were the big powerhouse, just like Babylon will become, just like uh, the Assyrians will become, just like the Greeks, just like the Romans. They were the powerhouse of that time. And so then in forty-one chap uh, chapter 41, verses 17 through 21, it says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. So Pharaoh tells Joseph about his dream and asks if he can interpret it. And Joseph says, no, I can't, but the Lord can. The Lord can interpret it for you. Um, Joseph and Daniel are the two that interpret dreams the only two that interpret dreams. And they both make it very, very clear that it's not them, it's not their wisdom. Nothing that they could do could interpret a dream. But that God is the one that that information comes from. So the dream was that Pharaoh is standing along the Nile and he sees these seven cows. And you know, one of the things I listened to that I thought was very interesting, they said, and I've, I've been to Egypt, I didn't see this, but I, they said that the cows literally go out into the river, out into the edges of the river. And because it is very hot there, the sun's blaring down and they go out into the edge of the river to cool off, and that that's where those reeds are, and they graze on those reeds in the edge of the river. And so he says he sees these cows, and they, they come up out of the water, and they're fat, and they're healthy. But then he sees seven other cows come up out of the water, and they're scrawny, and skinny, and ugly, and they look horrible. They're not healthy. And he says, and then the scrawny, ugly cows eat the fat cows 
But after they've eaten them, you can't even tell they've eaten them. They're still scrawny and ugly as they ever were. In all of Egypt, I've never seen cows as ugly and scrawny and skinny as these cows were. And so we got to think about the Nile too. Think about everything that we're, that we're learning here. The Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt. It was, it was, Egypt was the bread basket of the world. They were the powerhouse of the world and they were the bread basket of the world at that time. And I've driven, uh, well, I've been south of Cairo too, but I've driven from Cairo north to the Mediterranean Sea through that Nile, along the Nile River and then through the Nile Delta all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. It's a huge delta. It's much bigger than like where New Orleans is, where the Mississippi dumps into uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. The Nile Delta is huge. And every year, every summer, the floods come, the, the rains come, and that Nile River floods and it goes far beyond its banks. And when it does and then it recedes, it deposits this silt. There had been decayed uh, plants, there had been fish, fish bones, and all this kind of, and so it just richly every year fertilizes that land. And as a result, there are these crops in this green pasture land and crop land that's just amazing along the Nile. And then you get just outside of where that river's influence was, and it's nothing but sand dunes. It's totally useless and barren. And so it's really neat to see that. Now, Goshen was kind of on that eastern side of the delta. And we remember that when uh, when Joseph's family comes, they settle in the land of Goshen. And the, the Hebrew children produce and they're, they are very prosperous and their animals are prosperous and everything that they do is prosperous there in that land of Goshen. And so... It's just amazing to see, though, the, what the land looks like, where that river has influence on it, and then what the land looks like outside of those river, that river influence. And so Egypt, that northern part of Egypt, well, Egypt, the, in southern Egypt, two rivers run together. The White Nile, which, uh, don't get me, maybe, I don't know, Tanzania, the Blue Nile out of uh, Ethiopia. I may have those backwards. I don't remember for sure, but they flow together to make to into the Nile, and that's what flows on through Egypt and through Cairo and on to uh, on to the Mediterranean Sea. And it's it's amazing that river's like over sixteen hundred miles long. It's the longest river in the world, and it flows north, which is very unusual for a river. Um, but that's what kept Egypt fed and kept their, their cattle healthy and their, their crops growing and, and growing so richly. And so he has called in, uh, he, well, I, our lesson actually left out like 10 or 11 verses. And I want to tell you what happens in those. Um, he has his second dream. And the second dream, he sees seven heads, seven uh, heads of grain, and they're all on one stalk, and they're they're full and just these beautiful heads of grain. But then seven other scrawny heads of grain come on, and they devour the healthy heads of grain, but those those yucky, scrawny heads of grain still are scrawny, ugly heads of grain. So he calls in his magicians and he calls in all of his wise men from throughout, from throughout Egypt. And they just, they said, we don't know. We just don't know. We don't know what that means. And so he has revealed his dreams to Joseph and Joseph tells Pharaoh, he says, there's a reason why you had two dreams. They mean the same thing. But the reason you had two dreams is because God has firmly decided there's no turning back. God has firmly decided that this is what's going to happen to Egypt, and it's going to happen very soon. And so that is what he where what he tells Pharaoh. And then um, he he begins to tell Pharaoh what his dream means. And he says, the seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain represent seven years. Seven years of abundance and seven years of abundant crops and, and everything is going to be great. 
but the other seven years are seven years of famine. And those seven years of famine, we won't even remember the good years. We won't even remember the abundant years because those seven years of famine are going to be so bad. That's why when the the seven skinny cows ate the fat cows and the seven awful heads of grain ate the full heads of grain, that they didn't gain any weight. They didn't get anything because the famine was so bad that it couldn't be overcome. And so Pharaoh, and he actually... Um, he he goes on to he he tells him the good times are just even going to be forgotten they're going to be the bad times are going to be so bad and so then we get to verse uh chapter 41 verses 33 and thir through 37 and now let pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of egypt let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his officials. So after Joseph interprets his dream, then he tells Pharaoh why. Why he had this dream. And he says, the reason you had this dream is so that Egypt can prepare for what's coming. It's got to prepare for these terrible years or the country will be broken. People will die. This country will be ruined. It will be consumed and ruined by the famine. So that's why you've been told. And then he goes on to say, and God tells us why, and he also tells us how to prepare, how to prepare for that famine. So remember, God was with Joseph. Joseph was in these bad situations, but God was always with Joseph. And he says, so choose someone that's very wise and very discerning and put them in charge. And that person has to have the full authority of Pharaoh behind him so that he can take a fifth of all the grain each year that's grown for those seven years and store it up to be prepared for those seven years of famine. So Pharaoh and his officials say, oh, that sounds like a good plan to us. But the person needs to be very wise and very discerning, and he must have the full power of Pharaoh behind him. Famine and drought usually go hand in hand. We see that throughout the Bible. Sometimes um, it can be as a result of um, locusts. It was as a result of disease in the plants. It could be a result of... Um, what else? Um, uh, hail, maybe. Yeah, hail. There's times of hail. But anyway, most of the time, it was as a result of, uh, of, of just the droughts. Like, remember Elijah? He said, the, the heavens will not open until I tell them to open again. And they had seven years of drought, and it ruined that country. It, it brought them to their knees. And so, um, the lesson actually ends here. <laughs> they choose some strange places to end the lesson, but we are not going to end here. Um, some of the information between this week's lesson and next week's lesson applies more to this week. And so I'm going to put it in this week's and then I will put a, what applies in next week or more applies to next week in with that lesson. So Pharaoh says that, and his officials say, that sounds like a really good plan. And since God has revealed all of this to you, who could be more, who could be wiser and have more discernment than you? And so you will be in charge. You're the one that will be in charge. Even this pagan Pharaoh recognized that God was with Joseph and that God had helped Joseph understand this dream, and so Joseph should be the one that would be in charge. And he says, everyone must submit to you. Only I, Pharaoh, will be more powerful than you are. So Pharaoh puts his signet ring on his hand. He puts fine linen robes on him. He puts a gold chain around his neck. He uh, gives him a chariot, and his chariot goes right behind Pharaoh's chariot. So Joseph has gone from 
who only knows how long, at least two years, over two years, in this dungeon of a prison to being the second most powerful man in the world at that time. So Joseph was 30 years old when all of this takes place, when he began serving Pharaoh. He was so young, and he had been separated from his family most of his life. He had been separated from his source of learning about God, about his God, for most of his life. But he still grew in the Lord, and he grew through his adversity. He did begin storing rain for the seven years of abundance. Pharaoh told him, he said, you're going to be in charge of storing the grain. And when it's all said and done, you're going to be in charge of distributing the grain when the famine hits. And so during that seven years of abundance, Pharaoh gave him a wife. He gave him uh, the daughter of like the most important priest, not of his God, of course, but one of the most important priests in Egypt. During that time, Joseph and his wife had two sons. He had Manasseh, the oldest one, His name means forgetful because Joseph chose to forget all that bad stuff that happened to him prior to this. All of the things that happened to him in this land of Egypt, all the setbacks that he had had. Just think about it. Joseph, now that he is second in power, literally the second most powerful man in the world at this time, he could have gone back and said, okay, now it's time to get even with Potiphar's wife. I have all this authority. I'm going to get that woman. But he chose not to. He chose not to. He said, I'm going to forget all those bad things that happened to me. I'm moving on. And then his second son was Ephraim, which means fruitful. Joseph said, I am fruitful Even in the land of my affliction, God has made me fruitful. Even in the land of my affliction, God gave Joseph the ability to forget. To forget all those bad things that happened. And God made him fruitful, even in the land of his affliction. Through the experiences that Joseph had with Potiphar and the jailer, even though They seemed bad, really bad, calamity at times. God had used them to prepare him for a time such as this to borrow from Esther. For a time such as this. Those seven years of abundance came to an end. And Egypt fell into absolute famine. But they were prepared. And Jesus, and Jesus, (laughs) Joseph, of course, was in charge of distributing the grain, just like he had been in charge of collecting the grain. And the scripture says, all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was so severe everywhere. And that is where we will start scripture and everything for next week's lesson. But I want to put things in perspective. I want to start putting some things together. So far, we've just had bits and pieces of things. It's almost like like we've just thrown some puzzle pieces down on this table, but they make no sense and they don't fit together. And now they begin to fit together. And now we can begin to see a picture coming together. Do you remember Joseph's dreams back in like chapter 37 or so? Joseph had two dreams. He interpreted two dreams, the cupbearer and the baker. And Pharaoh had two dreams. So just like Joseph, Pharaoh has two dreams. Do you remember Joseph's dreams? In the first dream, he dreams that that there are 12 sheaths, sheaves, of grain that he and his brothers are are wrapping the stalks of grain and they're standing them in sheaths and his sheath remains standing but the other 11 as in his 11 brothers bow down their sheaths bow down to his and his brothers are enraged they say you think you're going to rule over us you think we're going to bow down to you you spoiled brat And then he has a second dream. In his second dream, he dreams that the sun and the moon and the stars bow to him. His father, his mother, and his brothers. 
This time, Jacob actually scolds him for telling that dream. But it says that Jacob doesn't forget the dream. He keeps it in his memory. But that was enough. That was enough. That was, that was it. He had blown it with his brothers. His brothers were through with him, and they put him in the cistern, and they end up selling him to the caravan that comes through on its way to Egypt, and that's how he ends up in Egypt. So the puzzle pieces are beginning to come together. His life is just these series of setbacks. It's like he takes two steps forward and then three steps back. He's the favorite son. Father makes him this beautiful ornate coat. Then his brothers sell him into slavery into Egypt. And then he rises to be the, the head of Potiphar's household. And then he gets lied about by a Potiphar's wife and he gets thrown in prison. He rises to be almost the keeper of the prison. And then eventually, of course, he's brought before Pharaoh. All of these roles have just prepared him for that incredible, incredible leadership role that will save all of Egypt, most of the world, and especially Joseph's own family. So how am I going to end this and how are we going to apply this to our lives? Joseph says, I'm a slave. I'm a slave but I'm going to be the best slave there ever was. And he rose to be the leader of Potiphar's household. And then he's thrown in prisoner. And he says, I'm a prisoner, but I'll be the best prisoner ever. And he rose to literally run the prison. We never hear him complain. We never hear him talk about how angry he is over his situations. He doesn't even complain about his dungeon prison. Isn't that a lesson for us? I complain all the time. And I never had a situation that even comes close to what Joseph suffered. He could have been depressed. He could have been self-absorbed. He could have blamed God. He could have blamed and hated his brothers. He could have blamed Potiphar's wife. He could have done any number of things. But he didn't. Sometimes our circumstances don't seem fair, and they're not our fault. It wasn't Joseph's fault that he got put in a caravan to Egypt and sold into slavery. It wasn't Joseph's fault that Potiphar's wife lied about him. But the circumstances were there regardless of whether it was his fault or not. We can be consumed. We can be resentful. We can have a pity party. Or we can just trust that God is in control. We can trust that God has a plan. We can trust that God might be preparing us, just like he did Joseph, for a role that we don't know anything about yet, that isn't even on the horizon. Even though we don't understand, we can rise above our circumstances, just like Joseph did. We can be the best possible us that we can be in those circumstances. Joseph could have used his new power. He could have gotten even with Potiphar's wife. He could have taken revenge out on her, but he chose to let it go. When the world sees actions like that from us, from Christians, they shake their head and they go, they really are different. There really is. They have something that I don't have. They are different. We can leave. We have to leave the Potiphar's wives. We all have Potiphar's wives in our lives. We all have someone who's wronged us. We all have someone who stabbed us in the back. We all have those things. But we have to leave the Potiphar's wives in our lives and the wrongs that we've suffered to God. We can't take them in our own hands or we're no different from the rest of the world. We have no idea what God has planned for our future. We just have to develop, just like Joseph did, that heart of trust in God. We count our blessings instead of our problems. We may not be able to control, many times we cannot control, the things and the circumstances 
that we find ourselves in. But what we can control is how we respond to those circumstances. That's what makes us, as Christians, different. Thank you.